Well, in that case, let us continue with chapter 45, A Shower of Blood. As he came in, the jeweller looked around inquiringly, but nothing seemed to arouse his suspicions, if he had none so far, or to confirm any that he might have had. Caderousse was still holding his banknotes and his gold in both hands. In both hands, La Carconte smiled at her guest as pleasantly as she could. "'Ah, I see,' said the jeweller. "'It appears you were afraid of having been underpaid, "'so you were counting your wealth after I left.' "'Not at all,' said Caderousse. "'But the events that brought us this fortune were so unexpected "'that we still cannot believe in it, "'and when we do not have the actual proof under our eyes, "'we imagine that we may still be dreaming.' "'The jeweller smiled. "'Do you have any travellers in your inn?' he asked. "'No.' Caderousse replied. We do not let rooms. We are too close to the town and nobody stops here. In, in that case, will I be a terrible nuisance to you? New nuisance, my dear sir, La Carconte said amiably. Not at all, I assure you. But where will you put me? In the upstairs room. That is your own room, isn't it? Don't worry, we have a second bed in the room next door to this one. Caderousse looked at his wife in astonishment. The jeweller hummed a little tune while warming his back at a log which La Carconte had just lit in the fireplace so that he could dry his clothes. Meanwhile, she put the meagre remnants of a dinner on one corner of the table where she had laid a cloth, adding two or three fresh eggs. Caderousse had, more, had once more shut the notes up in his wallet, the gold in his bag, and both of these in his cupboard. He was walking back and forth, grim and pensive, casting an occasional glance at the jeweller who stood steaming in front of the hearth, and when he started to dry on one side, turned to the other. "'There you are,' said La Carconte, putting a bottle of wine down on the table. "'Supper is ready when you want it.' And "'What about you?' asked Johannes. "'I'm not having anything,' Cadrus said. "'We had a very late dinner,' La Carconte hastened to add. Will I have to eat alone, then? We'll serve you, said La Carconte, with an eagerness that would have been exceptional in her, even with one of her playing guests. From time to time, Caderousse gave her a rapid glance. The storm continued. Do you hear that? La Carconte said. My word, you did well to come back. Despite which, said the jeweller, if the wind does drop while I am eating my supper, I shall set out again. It's the Mistral, Caderousse said, shaking his head. We've got it now until tomorrow. And he sighed. Well, I never, said the jeweller, taking his place at the table. Bad luck on anyone who's outside. Yes, said La Carconte. They will have a rough night. The jeweller began to eat, and La Carconte continued to fuss over him like an attentive hostess. Usually so crabby and ill-tempered, she had become a model of consideration and good manners. If the jeweller had known her earlier, he would have surely been astonished by the change, which could not help arousing his suspicions. As for Caderousse, he said nothing but went on walking up and down, and seemed unwilling even to look at his guest. When supper was over, Caderousse himself went to the door. "'I think the storm has passed,' he said. But at that moment, as if to contradict him, the house was shaken by an enormous clap of thunder, and a gust of rain and wind came in, blowing out the lamp. Caderousse shut the door, and his wife lit a candle at the dying fire. "'Here,' she said to the jeweller, "'you must be tired. I have put clean linen on the bed. Go on up and sleep well.' Johannes waited for a moment longer to see whether the storm would abate, and when he was sure that the thunder and rain were only increasing in strength, he said good night to his hosts and went up the stairs. He passed right above my head. I could hear each stair creak beneath his feet. La Carconte looked after him hungrily, while Caderousse turned his back and did not even glance in his direction. All these details, which I have recalled since the events, did not strike me while they were taking place before my eyes. When it comes down to it, 
everything that had happened was quite normal and, apart from the story of the diamond, which struck me as somewhat improbable, everything was perfectly consistent. As I was dropping with tiredness and intended myself to take advantage of the first break in the weather, I decided to sleep for a few hours, then make off while it was still dark. In the room above my head, I could hear the jeweller going about his preparations for spending as comfortable a night as he could. Shortly afterwards, the bed creaked under him. He had just got into it. I felt my eyes closing despite myself, and, as I had no suspicion of what was to come, I did not try to fight against sleep. I took one last look around the kitchen. Caderousse was sitting beside a long table on one of those wooden benches which they use instead of chairs in village inns. His back was turned to me, so that his face was hidden, though, even if he had been sitting on the opposite side of the table, it would still have been impossible for me to see his face, because his head was buried in his hands. La Carconte looked at him for a time, shrugged her shoulders, and went to sit opposite him. At that moment the dying embers of the fire caught a piece of dry wood that had until then remained unconsumed, and a brighter light flared up, illuminating the dark interior of the inn. La Carconte was staring at her husband, and, since he remained in the same position, I saw her reach out towards him with her gnarled hand and touch his forehead. Caderousse started. I thought I could see the woman's lips move, but either she was speaking in a very low voice or else I was already dulled by sleep, because the sound of her words did not reach me. In fact, I saw everything through a kind of mist, in that period of uncertainty that pre precedes sleep, when we feel that we are starting to dream. At length my eyes closed, and I was no longer aware of my surroundings. I was slumbering profoundly when I was awoken by a pistol shot, followed by a dreadful cry. Someone staggered a few steps across the floor of the bedroom, and an inert mass crashed on the stairs directly above my head. I was, not, I was still not entirely master of my senses. I heard groans, then stifled cries like those that might accompany a struggle. A final shout, lasting longer than the rest and ending in a series of moans, forced me entirely from my lethargy. I sat up on one elbow, opened my eyes, which could see nothing in the darkness, and put my hand to my forehead, where I thought I felt a heavy shower of warm rain dripping through the boards of the stairway. The horrid sounds had given way to the most profound silence. Then I heard a man's footsteps above my head and the creak of the stairs. He came down into the downstairs room, went across to the fireplace and lit a candle. It was Caderousse. His face was livid and his nightshirt covered in blood. Once he had lit the candle, he hurried back upstairs and I heard him moving about there again, with rapid and uneasy steps. After a short while, he came back. He was holding the box in his hand and making sure that the diamond was inside. Then he paused for a moment, trying to decide which of his pockets to put it in. Finally, having no doubt concluded that his pocket was not a secure enough hiding place, he wrapped it in the red kerchief around his neck. Then he hurried across to the cupboard, took out his banknotes and the gold, putting the first in the fob pocket of his trousers and the second in his jacket, seized two or three shirts, and, running across to the door, disappeared into the darkness. It was only now that everything became clear to me. I felt responsible for what had happened, as though I were really the guilty party. I thought I could hear someone moaning. Perhaps the unfortunate jeweller was not dead, and it was within my power to go to his aid and make up for some of the evil that I had, if not done, at least allowed to be done. I thrust my shoulder against one of the ill-fitting planks which separated the sort of cubby hole in which I was hiding from the downstairs room. The planks gave way, and I was inside the house. I hastened to pick up the candlestick and ran to the stairs. A body was lying across them. It was La Carconte. The pistol shot that I, he that I heard had been fired at her. 
Her throat was shot through, and, as well as this double wound that was bleeding copiously, there was blood coming from her mouth. She was stone dead. I stepped over the body and went upstairs. The bedroom was a shambles. Some of the furniture had been overturned and the sheets, which the unfortunate jeweller had clasped onto, were spread across the room. He himself was lying on the floor, his head resting against the wall and bathed in a pool of blood still flowing from three gaping wounds in his chest. In a fourth was embedded a long kitchen knife, of which only the handle could be seen. I went over to the second pistol, which had not been fired, probably because the powder was damp. Then I approached the jeweller. In fact, he was not yet dead. Hearing the sound that I made, and still more the shaking of the floor, he opened his wildly staring eyes, managed to focus them on me for a moment, moved his lips as though to speak, and expired. At this frightful scene, I almost fainted. Now that there was no assistance I could give anyone, I felt only one need, which was to be away from there. I plunged down the stairs, grasping my hair with my hands and giving a roar of terror. In the lower room, there were five or six customs men and two or three gendarmes, a small squad of armed men. They seized me. I made no attempt to resist because I was no longer in command of my senses. I merely tried to speak and gave some un inarticulate cries. Then I saw that the officers were pointing at me. I looked down and saw that I was covered in blood. The warm shower that I had felt rain down on me through the boards of the staircase was La Carcon's blood. I pointed to the place where I had been hiding. What is he trying to say? A gendarme asked. One of the customs men went to look. He's telling us that he came through here, he answered, pointing to the hole which had indeed been my means of entry. On this, I realized that they thought I was the assassin. I recovered my voice and my strength and broke away from the two men who were holding me, shouting, It wasn't me! It wasn't me! Two gendarmes leveled their carbines at me. Don't move, they said, or you're dead. But I tell you, it wasn't me, I cried. You can tell your little story to the judges in Nîmes, they replied. For the time being, follow us, and we warn you, don't try to resist. I had no intention of doing so. I was overwhelmed with amazement and terror. They put handcuffs on me, attached me to the tail of a horse, and led me into Nîmes. I had been followed by a customs man. He had lost sight of me somewhere near the inn and guessed that I would spend the night there. He went to fetch his comrades, and they arrived just in time to hear the pistol shot and to arrest me, amid all that evidence of guilt. I realised at once how hard it would be to convince anyone of my innocence. For this reason, I clung to just one thing. My first request from the examining magistrate was to beg him to have them search everywhere for a certain Abbe Boussoni who had stopped during the day at the inn of the Pont du Gard. If Caderousse had made up the story and the Abbe did not exist, I was clearly lost, unless Caderousse himself was arrested and confessed everything. Two months passed in which, be it said to the magistrate's credit, every effort was made to find the witness I had requested. I had already lost all hope. Caderousse had not been caught. I was to be tried at the next assize when, on September the 8th, that is to say three months and five days after the event, Abbe Boussoni, of whom I had quite given up hope, presented himself at the prison, saying that he had been told a prisoner wanted to speak to him. He said that he had learned of this in Marseille and hastened to comply with my request. You can imagine how eagerly I welcomed him. I told him everything that I had witnessed. I was reluctant to embark on the story of the diamond, but against all my expectations it proved to be true, point by point, and, also to my surprise, he gave complete credence to everything that I told him. Whereupon, encouraged by his sweet and forgiving nature, recognising that he entirely understood the customs of my country, 
and feeling that from such charitable lips I might perhaps receive absolution for the only crime I had ever committed, I told him, under the seal of the confessional, all about what had happened in Antwerp. What I did on impulse had the same effect as if I had contrived it. By confessing this first murder, even though nothing compelled me to do so, I proved to him that I had not committed the second. He left me with an injunction to have faith, promising to do all that was in his power to convince the judges of my innocence. I had evidence of his actual efforts on my behalf when I observed that the prison regime was gradually lightened, and when I learned that my case would be held over until the next assize following those that were due to convene. Meanwhile, as luck would have it, Cadreus was arrested abroad and brought back to France. He confessed everything, blaming his wife for planning and initiating the crime. He was sentenced to the galleys for life, and I was freed. So that was the time, Monte Cristo said, when you arrived at my door bearing a letter from Abbe Bussoni. Yes, Excellency, he had taken a distinct interest in me. Smuggling will be the end of you, he told me. If you are released from here, give it up. But, father, I asked, how shall I live and keep my poor sister? One of my penitents, he replied, esteems me greatly and has asked me to find him a reliable assistant. Would you like the post? I shall send you to him. Father, I exclaimed, how good you are to me. Swear to me that I shall never have cause to regret it. I raised my hand to swear the oath, but he said, that will not be necessary. I know what you Corsicans are like and love you for it. Here is my letter of recommendation. He wrote the few lines that I gave you, as a result of which your Excellency was good enough to take me into his service. Now, I ask your Excellency with pride, have you ever had cause to complain of me? No, the Count replied. I am pleased to admit it. You are a good servant, Batuccio though you have shown too little trust in me. I, Monsieur le Comte? Yes, you. How is it that you have a sister-in-law and an adoptive son, yet you have never mentioned either of them to me? Alas, Excellency, I have still to tell you of the saddest part of my life. I set off for Corsica. As you can imagine, I was in a hurry to see my poor sister again and to console her. But when I arrived at Rogliano, I found the house in mourning. There had been a terrible drama which their neighbours remember to this day. Benedetto had wanted my poor sister-in-law to give him all the money in the house and she, on my advice, had resisted his demands. One morning he threatened her and vanished for the whole day. She wept, dear Assunta, because she felt like a mother towards the wretch. When evening came she waited up for him. At eleven o'clock he came back with two of his friends, the usual companions of all his follies, and she held out her arms to him. But they seized her, and one of the three, I fear it could have been that infernal child, shouted, Let's play at torture! She will soon confess where her money is. The neighbour, Vasilio, happened to be in, by, uh, in Bastia. Only his wife had stayed at home, and she alone could hear or see what was going on in my sister's house. Two of them held poor Assunta. She, unable to believe that such a criminal act was possible, smiled at the men who were to become her tormentors. The third went to barricade the doors and windows, then returned, and the three of them, stifling the terrified cries elicited from her by these more serious preparations, dragged Assunta's feet towards the brazier on which they were relying to make her reveal where our little treasure was hidden. But as she struggled, her clothes caught fire. They let her go to avoid being burned themselves, and she ran to the door, a mass of flames. However, the door was locked. She turned to the window, but that was barricaded. At this, the neighbour heard frightful screams. Asunta was begging for help. Soon her voice was stifled. The screams became moans. The next day, when Vasilio's wife, after a night of terror and anxiety, dared to emerge and had the judge open the door of our house, they found Asunta half burned, though still breathing, the cupboards broken into and the money stolen. 
As for Benedetto, he had left Orleano never to return. I have not seen him since that day, or even heard speak of him. It was after hearing this sad news, Bertuccio continued, that I came to your excellency. I had no further occasion to mention Benedetto to you, since he had vanished, or my sister-in-law since she was dead. What did you conclude from all this? Monte Cristo asked. That it was a punishment for my crime, Bertuccio replied. Ah, those Vieuxforts are a cursed breed. I think you're right, the Count muttered grimly. Now, surely, Bertuccio went on, your Excellency will understand why this house, which I have not seen since that time, this garden in which I suddenly found myself and this spot on which I killed a man, were enough to cause those disturbing emotions which you observed and wanted to know the cause of. Even now I do not know whether Monsieur de Vifor is not there, at my feet, in the grave that he dug for his own child. Anything is indeed possible, Monte Cristo said, rising from the bench where he had been sitting, and he added under his breath, including that the Crown Prosecutor may not be dead. Abbe Bussoni did well to send you to me. You were right to tell me your story, because I shall not have any suspicions about you. As for Benedetto, that ill-named youth, have you never tried to find him, or discover what became of him? Never! Had I known where he was, instead of going to find him, I should have fled him like a monster. No, fortunately I have never heard anyone mention him. I hope he is dead. Don't hope too much, Bertuccio, said the Count. The wicked do not die in that way. God seems to take them under his protection to use them as the instruments of his vengeance. Indeed, said Bertuccio, all I ask heaven is that I shall never see him again. Now, the steward said, bowing his head, you know everything, Monsieur le Comte. You are my judge here below, as God will be there above. Will you not say a few words to console me? Yes, indeed. I can tell you what Abbe Bussoni would tell you. The man you struck down, that V4, deserved punishment for what he had done to you, and perhaps for other things as well. Benedetto, if he is still alive, will, as I told you, serve the purpose of some divine vengeance, then be punished in his turn. As for you, you have in truth only one thing to reproach yourself with. Ask yourself why, having saved that child from death, you did not return it to its mother. That was the crime, Bertuccio. Yes, Monsieur, that was the crime, and a true crime, for I was a coward in this. Once I had revived the child, there was only one thing for me to do, as you say, which was to send it back to its mother. But to do that I should have had to make inquiries, at attract attention, and perhaps give myself away. I did not want to die. I was attached to life because of my sister-in-law and because of that innate vanity which makes us want to remain whole and victorious after a vendetta, and then perhaps I was attached to life simply for the love of it. Oh, I am not a brave man like my poor brother." Bertuccio hid his face in both hands, and Monte Cristo stared long and enigmatically at him. Then. After a moment's silence that was made more solemn by the hour and the place, he said, with an unusual accent of melancholy, Monsieur Bertuccio, to bring this conversation to a worthy end, because it will be the last we shall have about these events, listen to me carefully, because I have often heard these words from Abbe Bussoni himself. There are two medicines for all ills, time and silence. Now, Monsieur Bertuccio, let me walk a while in this garden. The feelings that are so powerful for you, who took part in the drama, will be for me almost a sweet sensation, and one that will add to the value of my property. You understand, Monsieur Bertuccio, trees only give us pleasure because they give shade, and shade itself only pleases us because it is full of reveries and visions. I bought a garden, imagining that I was purchasing a simple space enclosed in walls, 
but it was not so at all. Suddenly the space has become a garden full of ghosts, which were nowhere mentioned in the deed of sale. I like ghosts. I have heard it said that the dead have never done in six thousand years as much evil as the living do in a single day. So go back inside, Monsieur Bertuccio, and sleep in peace. If the confessor who gives you the last rites is less compassionate towards you than Abbe Bussoni, fetch me, if I am still of this world, and I shall find the words that would gently soothe your soul as it prepares to start out on that rough voyage that they call eternity. Bertuccio bowed respectfully to the Count and went off, sighing. Monte Cristo remained alone, and, taking four steps forward, said, Here, beside this plane tree, is the grave where the child was placed. Over there, the little gate by which one might enter the garden. In the corner, the back stairway that led to the bedroom. I don't think I need to take all that down in my notebook. Here before my eyes, around me, beneath my feet in relief, is the living map of it. After a last walk around the garden, the Count went to look for his carriage. Bertuccio, seeing that he was preoccupied with his thoughts, got up on the seat beside the coachman without saying anything, and the carriage set off for Paris. That same evening, on arriving at the house on the Champs-Élysées, the Count of Monte Cristo inspected the whole residence as a man might have done who had been familiar with it for many years. Not once, even though he went ahead, did he open one door and mistake for another, or go up a staircase or down a corridor which did not lead directly to where he wanted it to take him. Ali accompanied him in this nighttime inspection. The Count gave Bertuccio several orders for the embellishment or rearrangement of the apartments, and taking out his watch, told Ali, It is half past eleven. Heidi will soon be here. Have the French women been told? Ali pointed towards the suite intended for the beautiful Greek, which was so separate from the rest that, when the door was concealed behind a tapestry, one could visit the whole house without realising that anyone was living here in a drawing room and two bedrooms. Ali, as we said, pointed to the suite, indicated the number three with the fingers of his left hand, and, opening the same hand out flat, put his head in it and closed his eyes as if asleep. Very well, Monte Cristo said, used to this sign language. There are three of them in the bedroom, then. Yes, Ali indicated, nodding his head. Madame will be tired this evening, Monte Cristo continued. She will no doubt want to sleep. She should not be obliged to talk. The French servants must simply greet their new mistress and then retire. Make sure that the Greek servant does not communicate with the French ones. Ali bowed. Shortly afterwards, there was the sound of someone calling to the concierge. The outer gate opened. A carriage drove along the path and stopped beneath the steps. The Count came down to find the carriage door already open. He offered his hand to a young woman wrapped in a green silk mantle embroidered with gold and covering her head. She took his hand, kissed it with a degree of love mingled with respect. A few words were exchanged, tenderly on the part of the young woman and with gentle gravity on that of the Count in that sonorous language with which antique Homer put into the mouths of his gods. Then, following Ali, who was carrying a torch of pink wax, the young woman, who was none other than the beautiful Greek who habitually accompanied Monte Cristo when he was in Italy, was shown into her apartments, and the Count retired to the wing that he had reserved for himself. At half-past midnight, all the lights in the house went out and you might have thought that all its inhabitants were asleep. Chapter 46 Unlimited Credit The next day, at about two in the afternoon, a barouche drawn by two splendid horses pulled up in front of Monte Cristo's door, and a man in a blue jacket, with silk buttons of the same colour, 
a white waistcoat crossed by a huge gold chain and hazel-coloured trousers, with a head of such black hair worn so low above the eyebrows that it seemed hardly natural, being so inconsistent with those wrinkles on the forehead that it was unable to disguise. In short, a man of between fifty and fifty-five trying to look forty put his head out of the window of a coupé with a baron's crown painted on its door, and sent his groom to inquire of the concierge whether the Count of Monte Cristo was at home. As he waited, the man examined the exterior of the house, what could be seen of the garden and the livery of a few servants who might be observed coming and going, and did so which, with such close attention as to amount almost to impertinence. His eye was sharp, but with more cunning in it than wit or irony. His lips were so thin that they vanished inside the mouth instead of protruding from it. Finally, the breadth and prominence of the cheekbones, an infallible sign of shrewdness, the retreating forehead, the bulging occiput which extended well beyond his wide and not in the least aristocratic ears, all contributed to give this gentleman, whom any ordinary person would have thought very respectable in view of his magnificent horses, the enormous diamond he wore in his shirt and the red ribbon that stretched from one buttonhole to another on his coat, a face which to a trained physiog physiognomist betrayed an almost repulsive character. The groom hammered on the concierge's window and asked, Does the Count, Count of Monte Cristo live here? His Excellency does live here, the concierge replied, but... And he looked at Ali, who nodded in reply. But, asked the groom, but His Excellency is not receiving guests, the concierge said. In that case, here is the card of my master, Baron Danglars. You will give it to the Count of Monte Cristo and tell him that my master made a detour while on his way to the house in order to have the honour of seeing him. I don't talk to His Excellency, said the concierge. The valet de chambre will take the message. The groom went back to the carriage. Well, said Danglars. The boy, somewhat crestfallen at the lesson he had just been given, delivered the concierge's reply to his master. Ha! the latter remarked. The gentleman is a prince, is he, calling himself Excellency and only allowing his valet de chambre to speak to him? No matter. Since he has a credit on me, he will have to see me when he wants money. And he slumped back into his carriage, shouting to the coachman in a voice that could be heard on the far side of the street, To the chambre des députés! Informed of his arrival, Monte Cristo had seen the Baron and been able to study him through the shutters of his house, thanks to a fine lorgette, with as much attention as Monsieur Danglars himself had given to the house, the garden, and the servants. Undoubtedly, he said with a gesture of disgust as he closed the binoculars in their ivory case, undoubtedly that man is an unprepossessing creature. How can anyone fail at first sight to recognize in him the serpent with its flattened head, the vulture with its bulging skull, and the buzzard with its rapacious beak? Ali, he cried, then struck the copper gong. Ali appeared. Call Batuccio. At the same moment, Batuccio entered. Your Excellency called for me? He said. Yes, sir, said the Count. Did you see the horses that just drew up at my door? I indeed, Excellency. I must say they were very fine. How is it? Monte Cristo said quizzically, when I asked you for the two finest horses in Paris, that there still remain in Paris two other horses equally as good which are not in my stables. At the sharp tone of voice and the raised eyebrow, Ali bent his head. It is not your fault, my dear Ali, the Count said in Arabic, with a softness that one would never have thought to hear in that voice. You are no expert when it comes to English horses. Ali's features resumed their accustomed serenity. Monsieur le Comte, said Bertuccio, the horses that you refer to were not for sale. Monte Cristo shrugged his shoulders. Bertuccio, 
Everything is always for sale when you know the price to put on it. Monsieur Danglars paid 16,000 francs for them, Monsieur le Comte. Then you should have offered him 32,000. He is a banker, and a banker never misses an opportunity to double his money. Is Monsieur le Comte serious? Bertuccio asked. Monte Cristo looked at his steward like a man astonished that anyone should dare to question his seriousness. This evening, he said, I have a visit to make. I wish to have those two horses draw my carriage with a new harness. Bertuccio retired, bowing. Reaching the door, he paused and said, At what time does His Excellency intend to pay this visit? At five o'clock. I might venture to point out to Your Excellency that it is now two o'clock, the steward said gingerly. I know, was Monte Cristo's only reply. Then, turning to Ali, he said, have all the horses paraded in front of Madame, so that she can choose the team that suits her best, and ask her to let me know if she will dine with me. In any case, no, in that case, we shall be served in her apartments. Now go and, as you do, send me the valet de chambre. Ali had hardly disappeared when the valet de chambre entered. Monsieur Baptistin, said the Count, you have been in my service for a year. This is the probationary period that I usually give to my servants. You suit me. Baptistin bowed. It remains for you to say if I suit you. Oh, Monsieur le Comte, Baptistin said unhesitatingly. Hear me out. You earn 1,500 francs a year, which is the stipend of a fine, brave army officer who risks his life every day. You enjoy meals that many a head clerk, a poor slave who is far busier than you, would envy. Though a servant, you yourself have servants who take care of your laundry and your belongings. Over and above your 1,500 francs in wages, you are taking a cut on the toiletries and similar purchases that you make for me, and stealing nearly an additional 1,500 francs every year. Oh, Excellency! I'm not complaining, Monsieur Baptistin. It's a reasonable amount. However, I wish it to stop forthwith. Nowhere will give you, f nowhere will you find a position comparable to the one that good fortune has given you here. I never beat my servants. I never swear. I never lose my temper. I always forgive a fault, but never negligence or forgetfulness. My orders are usually brief, but clear and precise. I prefer to repeat them twice or even three times, rather than for them to be carried out incorrectly. I am rich enough to know everything that I wish to know, and, be warned, I am very curious. So if I were ever to learn that you had spoken either good or ill of me, that you had commented on my actions or watched over what I do, you would leave my house immediately. I never give my servants more than one warning. You have had yours. You may go. Baptistin bowed and took three or four steps towards the door. By the way, the Count continued, I forgot to tell you that every year I invest a certain sum for each of my people. Those whom I dismiss inevitably lose this money, which reverts to those who remain and who will be able to collect it after my death. You have been a year with me. Your fortune has begun to grow. Let it continue. This homily, delivered in front of Ali, who remained impassive, since he did not understand a word of French, produced an effect on Monsieur Baptistin which will be understood by anyone who has studied the psychology of the French domestic servant. "'I shall try to conform in every respect to Your Excellency's wishes,' he said. "'Indeed, I shall model myself on Monsieur Ali.' "'Oh, do no such thing,' Monte Cristo said, as cold as marble." Ali has many faults as well as qualities. Don't follow his example, because Ali is an exception. He receives no wages. He is not a servant. He is my slave. He is my dog. If he were to fail in his duty, I should not dismiss him. I should kill him. Baptistin's eyes bulged. Do you doubt it? And the Count repeated the same words to Ali that he had spoken in French to Baptistin. 
Ali listened, smiled, went over to his master, knelt on one knee and respectfully kissed his hand. This little epitome of the lesson left Baptista utterly dumbfounded. dumbfounded. The Count motioned to Baptistan to leave them, and Ali to come with him. He led the way into his cabinet, and they spent a long time talking there. At five o'clock, the Count knocked three times on the gong. One strike for, was for Ali, two for Baptistan, and three for Baduccio. The steward entered. My horses, Monte Cristo demanded. They are ready with the carriage, Excellency, Baduccio replied. Shall I be accompanying Monsieur, Monsieur le Comte? No, just the coachman, Baptistan and Ali. The Count came downstairs and saw, harnessed to his carriage, the horses that he had admired that morning in Danglars' barouche. He glanced at them as he went past. They are very fine indeed, he said. You did well to buy them, even though you were a little late. <laughs> Excellency, said Bertuccio, it took a great deal of trouble to get them, and they were very expensive. Are they any the less attractive for that? the Count asked, shrugging his shoulders. If your Excellency is content, Bertuccio said, then all is well. Where is your Excellency going? To the Rue de la Chaussée d'Antin, to Baron Danglars. This conversation took place at the top of the front steps, Bertuccio made as if to go down the first step. One moment, Monsieur, Monte Cristo said, holding him back. I need an estate near the seaside, in Normandy, for example, between Le Havre and Boulogne. You see, I am giving you room to manoeuvre. The property must have a little harbour, a small creek or bay where my corvette can enter and moor. It has a draught of only fifteen feet. It will always be kept ready to put to sea, at any hour of the day or night when I choose to give the signal. You will inquire of all the notaries about a property of this kind, and, when you have found one, you will visit it. And if you are satisfied, buy it in your name. The corvette must be sailing towards Fecon, I suppose. I saw it put to sea on the very evening when we left Marseille. And the yacht? The yacht was ordered to remain at Les Martigues. Very well. From time to time you must keep in touch with their two captains, so that they do not fall asleep at their posts. What about the steamship? Which is in Chalon? Yes. The same orders as for the two sailing ships. Very good. As soon as the property has been acquired, I shall have relays of horses ready every ten leagues on the roads to the north and to the south. Your Excellency can count on me. Monte Cristo gave a nod of satisfaction, went down the steps and leapt into his carriage, which was borne forward at a trot by the superb team of horses, and did not stop until it reached the banker's, man ba banker's mansion. Danglars was chairing a commission, which had been appointed for a railway company when they came in to announce that the count when they came in to announce the Count of Monte Cristo. In any case, the meeting was almost finished. At the mention of the Count's name, he got up. Gentlemen, he said, addressing his colleagues, several of whom were honourable members of one house or the other, I apologise for leaving you in this way, but I must, ask, I must ask you to believe that the firm of Thompson and French in Rome has sent me a certain Count of Monte Cristo and opened a limitless credit for him with me. This is the most ludicrous joke any of my correspondents abroad has yet played on me. As you may well imagine, I was, and still am, consumed by curiosity. This morning I went to visit the so-called Count. If he was a real one, you will agree he would not be so rich. Monsieur was not at home to me. What do you think? It seems our Monte Cristo has the manners of a princeling or a prima donna, doesn't it? Aside from that, the house on the Champs-Élysées, which he owns, I inquired about that, it appeared re respectable enough, but unlimited credit, Danglars repeated, smiling one of his odious smiles. That's something that makes the banker with whom such a credit is opened rather fussy about his man. So I was keen to see him. I think they are trying to lead me up the garden path. But he who laughs last... 
Monsieur Le Baron ended, stressing the last words with an expressive flourish that made his nostrils flare, then left his guests and went into a, re into a reception room, done up in white and gold, that had made the tongues wag on the Chaussée d'Antin. He had asked the visitor to be brought here to impress him right from the start. The Count was standing, inspecting some copies of Albano and Fattore, which had been passed off on the banker as originals, and which, copies were, though they were, clashed with the beading in every shade of gold decorating the ceiling. On hearing Danglars come in, the Count turned around. Danglars nodded in greeting, and gestured to the Count to sit down on an armchair of gilded wood upholstered in white satin and embroidered in gold thread. The Count did so. I have the honour of speaking to Monsieur de Monte Cristo. And I, the Count replied, to Monsieur le Baron Danglars, Knight of the Legion of Honour and Member of the Chamber of Deputies. The Count was repeating all the titles to be found on the Baron's visiting card. The Baron took the hint and bit his lip. Forgive me, Monsieur he said, for not addressing you at the start by the title under which you were introduced to me. But, as you know, we live under a government of the people, and I am a representative of the interests of the people. With the result, Monte Cristo replied, that, while retaining the custom of having yourself called Baron, you have abandoned that of calling other men Count. Oh, I'm not even bothered about it for myself, Monsieur, Danglars replied casually. They granted me the title and made me a Knight of the Legion of Honour for some services rendered, but... But you abdicated your titles, as formerly Monsieur de Montmorency and Monsieur Le Lafayette did. You offer a fine example to your fellow men, Monsieur. Well, well, not, not altogether, Danglars replied with some embarrassment. You understand, for, for the servants. Ah, so you call yourself Monseigneur for your staff. Monsieur for journalists and a citizen for your agents. These nuances are quite appropriate in a constitutional regime. I understand perfectly. Danglars clenched his teeth. He could see that on this ground he was no rival for Monte Cristo, so he tried to return to terrain that was more familiar to him. Uh, Monsieur le Comte, he said, bowing, I have received a letter from the firm of Thompson and French. I am delighted, Monsieur le Baron. Oh, permit me to address you as your servants do. It's a bad habit I picked up in countries where they still have barons, precisely because they are not making them any more. As I say, I'm charmed. I have no need to present myself, which is always embarrassing. So, you have received a letter. Yes, said Danglars, but I have to admit that I did not entirely take its meaning. Really? I even had the honour to visit you to ask for an explanation. Very well, Monsieur. I am here, ready and listening. I have the letter, Danglars said, on my person, I believe. He rummaged around in his pocket. Ah, yes, here we are. This letter opens an unlimited credit on my bank on behalf of the Count of Monte Cristo. So, Monsieur le Baron, what needs explaining in that? No, nothing, Monsieur, only that the word unlimited? It is a French word, is it not? You must understand, the letter comes from an Anglo-German firm. Uh, yes, Monsieur, indeed, there is no problem in respect of the syntax, but the same is not true of the arithmetic. Are you trying to tell me, Monte Cristo asked, with the most innocent air that he could manage, that the firm of Thompson and French is not absolutely reliable, in your opinion, Monsieur le Baron? I, I should be most sorry to hear it, for I have some money invested with them. Oh, perfectly reliable, Danglars replied, with a smile almost of mockery. But the meaning of the word unlimited in financial terms is so vague. As to be unlimited, perhaps, said Monte Cristo. Just so, monsieur, that is precisely what I meant. Now, where something is vague, there is there is doubt, and as the wise man says, when in doubt, don't. In other words, Monte Cristo remarked, 
You mean that while the firm of Thompson and French may be inclined to folly, that of Danglars is unwilling to follow its example. H how, how do you mean, Monsieur le Comte? Just this. Messrs. Thompson and French engage in unlimited business, but Monsieur Danglars does put a limit on his. As he was saying only a moment ago, he is a wise man. <laughs> Monsieur, the banker replied haughtily, no one has yet found my funds to be wanting. So it seems that I shall be the first, Monte Cristo replied coldly. Who says that you will? All these explanations you require of me, Monsieur, which seem to me very much like cold feet. Danglars bit his lip. This was the second time that the man had worsted him, and this time on his own ground. His condescending politeness was only an affectation, and he was getting close to an extremity very similar to condescension, which is impertinence. Monte Cristo, on the other hand, was smiling with the best grace in the world. When he wished, he could adopt an air of innocence that was extremely favourable to him. To come to the point, monsieur, said Danglars, after a moment's silence, I shall try to make myself plain by asking you yourself to state the amount that you intend to draw on us. But, my good sir, said Monte Cristo, determined not to lose an inch of ground in the debate, if I asked for unlimited credit from you, that was precisely because I did not know what amount I should require. The banker felt that the moment had at last come to regain the upper hand. He sat back in his chair, and with a broad and supercilious smile said, Oh, monsieur, do not be afraid to ask. You will then be able to satisfy yourself that the funds of Danglars and company, limited though they may be, can meet the largest requirements. Even if you were to ask for a million... I beg your pardon? said Monte Cristo. I said a million... Danglars repeated with idiotic self-satisfaction. <laughs> what use would a million be to me? said the Count. Good heavens, Monsieur! If all I wanted was a million, I should not have bothered to open a credit for such a paltry sum. A million? But I always carry a million in my portfolio or my wallet. And, opening a little box where he kept his visiting cards, he took out two bonds for 500,000 francs each, drawn on the treasury and payable to bearer. A man like Danglars needed to be bludgeoned rather than pricked. The blow had the desired effect. The banker reeled and felt faint. He looked at Monte Cristo with amazement, the pupils of his dazed eyes terrifyingly dilated. Come now, said Monte Cristo, admit it. You have no faith in the firm of Thompson and French. Well, that's no problem. I anticipated it, and, though I know little about business, I took the necessary precautions. Here are two other letters like the one addressed to you. The first comes from the firm of Arnstein and Escales in Vienna, drawn on the Baron de Rothschild, the other from the House of Bering in London, drawn on Monsieur Lafitte. Just say the word, Monsieur, and I shall relieve you of any anxiety by going to one or other of those two firms. That was it. Danglars was defeated. With hands visibly trembling, he opened the letter from Vienna and the other from London, which the Count was holding out to him, verified the signatures with a degree of attention that would have been insulting to Monte Cristo if he had not made allowance for the banker's bewilderment. Ah, Monsieur, here are three signatures that are worth many millions, Danglars said, rising to his feet, as though to salute the power of gold personified in the man seated before him. Three unlimited credits on our three firms. Excuse me, Monsieur le Comte, but while I am no longer suspicious, I may at least be allowed to feel astonishment. Oh, a firm like yours would not be astonished by such a thing? said Monte Cristo, with all the condescension he could muster. So, you can send me some money, I assume? Name the sum, Monsieur le Comte. I am, at, I am at your orders. Very well, then, Monte Cristo continued. Now that we are agreed, we are agreed, aren't we? Danglars nodded. And you are no longer at all suspicious? 
Monsieur le Comte, please, the banker exclaimed. I, I was never suspicious. No, no, you simply wanted some proof, nothing more. Very well, now that we are agreed and you no longer have any suspicion, let us settle on a broad amount for the first year. Let's say six million? Six, six, mi <clears throat> six million. Very well then, said Danglars, choking. If I should need more, Monte Cristo continued, we can increase the amount, but I am only expecting to stay a year in France, and during that year I do not think I shall exceed that amount. Well, we shall see. So, for a start, please have 500,000 francs sent, fat, sent round to me tomorrow. I shall be at home until midday, and in any case, if I were to go out, I should leave a receipt with my steward. The money will be with you tomorrow at ten in the morning, Monsieur le Comte. Danglars replied. Would you like gold, banknotes, or coin? Half gold and half notes, if you please. He got up to leave. One thing I must confess, Monsieur le Comte, Danglars said. I thought that I was rather well acquainted with all the great fortunes in Europe, but I have to admit that yours, though it seems to be considerable, had entirely escaped my notice. Is it recent? No, monsieur, Monte Cristo replied. On the contrary, it dates back a long way. It is a sort of family treasure which was not allowed to be touched. The accumulated interest tripled the capital sum. The period allotted under the will only elapsed a few years ago, so I have only been drawing on the money for a short time, and your ignorance in the matter is entirely natural. In any event, you will shortly be better informed." The Count accompanied these last words with one of those faint smiles that so terrifi terrified France d'Epinay. "'With your taste and your intentions, monsieur,' Danglars continued, "'you will exhibit in Paris a degree of extravagance before which we shall pale into insignificance, we poor millionaires. However, as you strike me as a connoisseur, I did notice you looking at my pictures when I entered. I beg your permission to show you my collection all guaranteed old masters. I do not like the modern school. You are quite right, monsieur. On the whole, they have one great shortcoming, which is that they have not had yet time to become old masters. Could I show you some statues by Thorvaldston, Bartolini, or Canova? All foreigners. I don't favour French artists. You have the right to be unjust towards them, monsieur, since they are your fellow countrymen. Uh, but, but all that can come later, when we know each other better. Uh, for the time being, with your permission, of course, I shall be content to induce, uh, introduce you to Baroness Danglars. Uh, forgive my eagerness, Count, but a client such as yourself is almost one of the family." Monte Cristo bowed, indicating that he would accept the honour that the financier was offering to accord him. Danglars rang and a footman approached, dressed in brightly shining livery. Is the Baroness at home? Danglars asked. Yes, Monsieur le Baron, the footman replied. Is she alone? Uh, no, Madame has company. It would not be indiscreet of me to introduce you when someone else is present, Count. You are not travelling incognito. No, Baron, Monte Cristo said, smiling. I do not allow myself that privilege. Who is with Madame? Is it Monsieur de Bray? Danglars asked with a good humour that made Monte Cristo smile to himself, informed as he already was about the financier's domestic secrets. Yes, Baron, Monsieur de Bray, the footman replied. Danglars nodded, then turned to Monte Cristo. Monsieur Lucien de Bray, he said, is an old friend of the family and the private secretary to the Minister of the Interior. As for my wife, she had to give up a title when she married me, for she belongs to an old family. She is a Mademoiselle de Servières, the widow from her first marriage to the Marquis de Nargon. I do not have the honour of knowing Madame, Madame Danglars, but I have already met Monsieur Lucien de Bray. Ha! Huh, Danglars exclaimed. Where was that? At Monsieur de Morcerf's. Oh, so you know the little Viscount, said Danglars. We found ourselves in Rome at the same time during the carnival. Oh, yes, indeed, 
said Danglars. Did I not hear a rumour about something strange, something like a strange adventure with bandits and robbers in the ruins? He escaped by a miracle. I, I think he told my wife and daughter something about that when he returned from Italy. Madame la Baron, Baronne is expecting your lordships, said the footman, coming back into the room. I shall lead the way, Danglars said with a bow. And I shall follow you, said Monte Cristo. And there I think we shall take a break. Oh, the amount of shade thrown. Oh! oh. See, I really like how, how well this is translated, actually, because that whole... That whole passive aggressive like conversation is um I guess probably a little difficult to directly translate and get the right amount of passive aggressiveness. I don't really know. But it's pretty great. Um more shade thrown than a fight in the lighting store. Great job. Fantastic job. Your workshop it, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, it couldn't be me that did this murder. Here's another one that I did as a proof. Yeah, there's some interesting logic going on in that story, I feel. Um, but yeah. Yeah, and the whole, the whole murder... You, you're doing well there. Good, good job. Good, good job with typing. Yeah, that whole murder bit was uh, pretty graphic, wasn't it? Um, yeah. Well, anyway. Um, <laughs> uh... Go, go have break, uh, do break things, and um, we shall be back in about five minutes. And bye for now.
and we are back. I hope everybody has had a good break, done break related things, such as getting a tea, which I have done. Um, and yes, yeah, so I hope everybody is enjoying enjoying the story thus far. Um, I am I'm certainly enjoying the uh, the passive aggressiveness and the fact that uh, Dantes has now re-encountered Danglar who doesn't seem like the greatest guy um, but uh, but yeah oh and by the way we are just over halfway now <laughs> Uh, it's gonna be double hooray, exactly. So uh, probably got another. Hang on, what what are we in? We're in. Oh God, another like five months of this. Blimey. Yeah. Someone will have to tell me if they're getting bored of Counter Monte Cristo at some point because, oh boy, it's a long one. Tea is still very hot. So I shall not drink it yet. Although it's quite nice actually. Well not brain leaping from thing to thing. Um yeah, my, my like I can properly like open my book now because it's sort of because it's halfway, it's like it's even. Which is quite nice. So I don't have to hold it and hurt my wrist. Because it's a big book. Uh Right, so yes, shall we continue? Let us continue. Oh god, what chapter are we on now? Oh yeah. Let's take a sip of my water. Chapter 47. The Dapple Greys. Followed by the Count, the Baron led the way through, the, through a long succession of apartments characterised by tedious ostentation and expensive bad taste, until they reached Madame Danglars' boudoir, a small octagonal room hung with red satin and trimmed with Indian muslin. The chairs were in antique gilded wood and covered in old fabrics. Above the door were paintings of shepherds and shepherdesses in the style of Boucher. Two pretty pastels in oval frames complementing the rest of the decor made this little room the only one in the house with some individuality. Admittedly, it had been overlooked in the general design agreed between Monsieur Danglars and his architect, one of the most famous and eminent members of his profession under the Empire, so only the Baroness and Lucien de Bray were involved in doing it up. Danglars, a great admirer of an admirer of antiquity, as interpreted by the Directoire, consequently had nothing but contempt for this charming little cubbyhole to which, in any case, he was usually admitted only on condition that he brought someone with him to excuse his presence. So, in reality, it was not Danglars who introduced visitors, but he himself who was introduced, to be received well or ill, depending on how much the visitor's face pleased or displeased about the Baroness. Madame Danglars, who could still be described as beautiful despite her thirty-six years, was at the piano, a little masterpiece of cabinet-making, while Lucien de Bray was sitting at an embroidery table, leafing through an album. Before their arrival, Lucien had had time to tell the Baroness seven, several things about the Count. The reader knows what an impression Monte Cristo made on Albert's guests over luncheon, though Debray was not easily susceptible to such impressions, this one had not yet faded, but left its mark on the details he gave to the Baroness. Madame Danglars's curiosity, excited some time before by what she had learned from Morcerf, and now by Lucien, was consequently at its apogee. The tableau with the piano and the album was just one of those little social ruses which helped to disguise one's preparations, and the Baroness greeted Monsieur Danglars with a smile, which was unusual on her part. 
As for the Count, he received a solemn but graceful curtsy in exchange for his bow, while Lucian gave him a nod, acknowledging the brevity of their acquaintanceship, greeting Danglars in a more intimate fashion. Baroness, Danglars said, allow me to introduce the Count of Monte Cristo, who has been highly recommended to me by my business associates in Rome. I have only one thing to say about him, but it is one that will instantly make him the darling of all our lovely ladies. He has come to Paris, intending it to stay here for a year, and in that time to spend six million francs, so we can expect a series of balls, dinners and feasts, in which I hope the Count will not forget us any more than we shall forget him in our own humble entertainments. The flattery in this introduction was fairly gross. However, it is so rare for a man to come to Paris, meaning to spend a prince's fortune in a single year, that Madame Danglars cast a glance at the Count which was not devoid of interest. "'When did you arrive, monsieur?' she asked. "'Yesterday, madame.' "'And you have come, as I am told is your custom, from the ends of the earth?' This time quite simply from Cadiz, madame. You find us at an abominable season. Paris is frightful in summer. There are no more balls, no gatherings, no parties. The Italian opera is in London. The French opera is everywhere except in Paris. And as for the Théâtre Français, I suppose you know that it is no longer anywhere. So we have nothing to entertain us, except a few miserable races at the Champ de Mar and Satori. Will you be racing your horses at all, Monsieur le Comte? I shall be doing everything, madame, the Count said, that is done in Paris, if I am fortunate enough to find someone who can reliably inform me on the customs of the country. Do you like horses, Monsieur? I have spent part of my life in the East, madame, and as you know, Orientals prize only two things in the world, the nobility of horses and the beauty of women. My dear Count, said the Baroness, you might have been gallant enough to put women first. You see, madame, I was right a moment ago when I said that I needed a tutor to guide me in the ways of the country. At this, Madame Danglars's favourite chambermaid came in, went over to her mistress and whispered a few words in her ear. The Baroness paled. Impossible, she exclaimed. It is the plain truth, Madame, for all that, the chambermaid replied. Madame Danglars turned to her husband. Is this true, Monsieur? What, Madame? asked Danglars, visibly uneasy. What this girl has just told me. Which is? She tells me that when my coachman went to harness my horses, they were not in the stable. I ask you, what can this mean? Uh, Madame, said Danglars, please listen to me. Oh, I am listening, Monsieur, because I am curious to know what you have to tell me. I shall let these gentlemen judge between us, and I am going to start by explaining the situation to them. Gentlemen, she said, turning to them, Baron Danglars has ten horses in his stables. Among these ten, there were two which belonged to me, delightful creatures, the finest horses in Paris. You know them, Monsieur de Bray, my dapple greys. Well, just when Madame de Vifort is to borrow my carriage, which I promised to her that so, she, so that she could go in it tomorrow to the Bois, the two horses suddenly cannot be found. I presume that Monsieur Danglars saw the opportunity to make a few thousand francs and sold them. Oh, God, what a vile breed they are, these speculators. Uh, uh, madame, Danglars replied, the, those horses were, were too lively. They were barely four years old, and I was constantly afraid for your safety. So, Monsieur, asked the Baroness, you very well know that for the past month I have had the services of the finest coachman in Paris, Unless, that is, you sold him with the horses. My, my dear friend, I shall find a pair for you that are precisely the same, or even finer, if that is possible. Uh, but this time they will be mild-mannered and calm, and not make me so worried for you. The Baroness shrugged her shoulders with a look of profound contempt. 
Danglars appeared not to notice these less than wifely manners and turned to Monte Cristo, saying, Sincerely, I am I am sorry that we did not meet earlier, Monsieur le Comte. Are you setting up your house? Indeed I am, said the Count. I should have offered them to you. Believe me, I gave them away for nearly nothing. But, as I said, I wanted to be rid of them. They are a young man's horses. Thank you, said the Count. But I bought some this morning which are serviceable and not too expensive. Come, Monsieur de Bray, you are a connoisseur, I think. Take a look. While de Bray was going over to the window, Danglars went to his wife. You'll never guess, he whispered to her. Someone came and offered me a ridiculous price for the horses. I don't know who the madman can be who is determined to ruin himself by sending his steward to me this morning, but the fact is that I made 16,000 francs on the deal. So don't sulk. I'll give you four thousand and two to Eugénie. Madame Danglars gave him a withering look. Bless my soul! Debray exclaimed. What is it? asked the Baroness. If I am not mistaken, those are your horses, your very own, harnessed to the Count's carriage. My double greys? Madame Danglars cried, running over to the window. Yes, undoubtedly. Danglars was astonished. "'Is it possible?' said Monte Cristo, feigning astonishment. I I "'Incredible!' the banker muttered. The Baroness whispered something to Debray, who came across to Monte Cristo. "'The Baroness would like to ask you for how much her husband sold you the team.' "'I, I really don't know,' said the Count. My steward meant it as a surprise to me, which cost me, I, I believe, 30,000 francs? Debray conveyed this reply to the Baroness. Danglars was so pale and disconcerted that the Count pretended to try and console him. You see how ungrateful women are, he said. The Baroness is not in the slightest touched by your consideration for her safety. Indeed, the word is not ungrateful, but mad. Then... What do you expect? They always like what is harmful to them. So the simplest answer, my dear Baron, believe me, is to let them have their heads. Then if they break them, they have only themselves to blame. Danglars did not answer. He could foresee, foresee a disastrous quarrel looming on the horizon. Already the Baroness's eyebrow was raised, and like that of Olympian Jove, it presaged a storm. Hearing the first rumble, Debray made some excuse and left. Monte Cristo, not wanting to compromise the position that he hoped to gain by staying any longer, bowed to Madame Danglars and retired, leaving the Baron to his wife's rage. Very well, then, he thought as he left. I have achieved my aim. I now hold the domestic bliss of this household in my hands and am simultaneously about to win the heart of the Baron and that of his wife. How fortunate! But in the meantime, he added, I have not yet been introduced to Mademoiselle Eugène Danglars, whom I should have, very been, have been very pleased to meet. However, he continued, with a little smile that was all his own, we are in Paris, and we have lots of time before us. It can wait and at this he stepped into his carriage and returned home. Two hours later, Madame Danglars received a charming letter from the Count of Monte Cristo, in which he told her that he did not wish to make his entry into Parisian society by upsetting a beautiful woman, and so begged her to accept her horses. They came in the same harness that she had seen on them that morning, except that the Count had had a diamond sewn into the centre of each of the rosettes that they wore on their ears. Danglars also had a letter. In it, the Count asked his permission to convey his, this millionaire's whim to the Baroness and begged him to excuse the oriental gesture that accompanied their return. That evening, Monte Cristo left for Antoil, accompanied by Ali. The next day, around three o'clock, Ali was summoned by a ringing of the bell. He came into the Count's study. 
Ali, you have often told me of your prowess with a lasso. Ali nodded and proudly drew himself up to his full height. Very well. With a lasso, could you bring down a bull? Ali nodded. A tiger? Again, Ali nodded. A lion? Ali imitated the motions of a man throwing a lasso and produced a strangled roar. It, yes, I understand, said Monte Cristo. Have you ever hunted a lion? Ali nodded proudly. But could you stop two horses in their tracks? Ali smiled. Good. Then listen to me. In a short while, a carriage will go by, drawn by two dapple grey horses, the same ones that I had yesterday. Even at the risk of being run over, you must stop that carriage in front of my door. Ali went down into the street and drew a line on the cobbles. Then he came back and showed the line to the Count, who had been watching him. The Count tapped him gently on the shoulder, which was his way of expressing his thanks. Then Ali went to smoke his chibouk on the cornerstone between the house and the street, while Monte Cristo paid no further heed to the matter. However, at about five o'clock, which was the time when the Count expected the carriage to arrive, one might have observed in him some almost imperceptible signs of impatience. He walked up and down in a room overlooking the street, listening out from time to time, time to time, and occasionally going across to the window, through which he could see Ali expelling puffs of smoke with a regularity that showed he was entirely absorbed in the important business of sh smoking his chibouk. Suddenly, there was a distant sound of rumbling which approached at thunderous speed. Then a barouche appeared, drawn by horses which the coachman was vainly trying to restrain as they dashed wildly forward, bristling and lunging madly this way and that. In the barouche was a young woman, clasping a child of seven or eight years old in such an excess of terror that she had even lost the strength to cry out. A stone under the wheel or the branch of a tree would have been enough to smash the coach to pieces, it was already disintegrating as it drove down the middle of the street, and you could hear the terrified shouts of the onlookers as, as it approached. Suddenly Ali put down his jabouk, took the lasso out of his pocket, threw it, and wrapped it three times round the front legs of the left-hand horse. He was pulled three or four yards by the shock, but after these few yards the lassoed horse came down, falling against the shaft which it broke, thwarting the efforts of his companion to continue racing forward. The coachman took advantage of the momentary pause to leap off his box, but Ali had already grasped the nostrils of the second horse in his iron fingers, and the animal, whinnying in pain, had dropped, shuddering to the ground beside its fellow. All this was accomplished in the time that it takes to fi a bullet to find its mark. The interval was enough, however, for a man to rush out of the house opposite which the accident happened followed by several servants. Just as the coachman was opening the door of the coach, the man lifted out the lady, one of whose hands was grasping the upholstery of the seat, while the other clasped her son, who was senseless with fear. Monte Cristo carried both of them into the drawing-room, and set them down on a sofa, saying, Have no fear, madame, you are safe. The woman recovered her senses, and in reply indicated her son, with a look more eloquent than any entreaty. The boy was still unconscious. Madame, I understand you, the Count said, examining the child, but rest assured he is unhurt, and fear alone has left him in this state. Oh, oh, monsieur, the mother cried, perhaps you are just saying this to reassure me. Look how pale he is. Edouard, my son, my child, answer your mother. Oh, please, monsieur, send for a doctor. My fortune to the man who can save my son. Monte Cristo made a reassuring gesture to calm her, and, opening a chest, took out a flask of bohemian glass encrusted with gold. It contained a blood-red liquid, a single drop of which he put on the child's lips. Although still pale, the boy immediately opened his eyes. At this, the mother became almost delirious with joy. Where am I? she cried. To whom do I owe such happiness after so frightful an ordeal? 
Madame, you are in the house of a man who could not be more delighted to have relieved you of your woe, the Count replied. A cursed curiosity, the lady said. All Paris was speaking about those magnificent horses of Madame Danglars, and I was crazy enough to wish them to wish to try them out. What? the Count exclaimed, making a splendid appearance of surprise. Are those the Baroness's horses? Yes, monsieur. Do you know her? Madame Danglars, yes, I have had the honour, and I am all the more delighted at seeing you safe from the danger in which these horses put you, since you might have blamed me for it. I bought them yesterday from the Baron, but the Baroness seemed to regret losing them so much that I sent them back to her the same day, begging her to accept them as a present from me. This means that you must be the Count of Monte Cristo about whom Hermine spoke so much to me yesterday. Yes, madame, said the Count. And I, monsieur, am Madame Héloïse de Villefort. The Count bowed like a man on hearing a name that was completely unknown to him. Oh, how grateful Monsieur de Villefort will be to you, Héloïse continued. He owes you the lives of both of us. You have given him his wife and his son. Assuredly, without your noble-hearted servant, both this dear child and myself would have been killed. Alas, madame, I still shudder to think of the danger you were in. I do hope you will allow me to give a suitable, suitable reward to the man for his determined action. Please, madame, said Monte Cristo, don't spoil Ali for me, either with praise or with gifts. I don't want him to learn bad ways. Ali is my slave. In, serving, in saving your life, he was merely serving me, which it is his duty to do. But he risked his own life, said Madame de Villefort, much impressed by the Count's masterful tone. He owes me that life, the Count replied. I saved it so it belongs to me. Madame de Villefort said nothing. Perhaps she was thinking about this man who made such a strong first impression. In the momentary silence, the Count had time to look at the child, whom the mother was smothering in kisses. He was small and lanky, with a whiteness of skin more common in redheads. However, an unruly forest of black hair covered his domed forehead, and, falling across his shoulders on each side of his face, doubled the light of juvenile cunning and spitefulness that shone from his eyes. His broad mouth and slender lips were just recovering their colour. This eight-year-old's features were those of a child of twelve at least. His first movement was to brusquely shake himself free of his mother's arms and, go, and to go across to the chest from which the Count had taken the phial of elixir. Immediately he opened it, and, without asking permission, like a child used to having his every whim satisfied, began to take the stoppers off the bottles. "'Don't do that, my young friend,' the Count said sharply. "'Some of those liquids are dangerous, not only to drink, but even to breathe in.' Madame de Villefort paled and clasped her son's arm, pulling him back to her. Yet the Count noticed that, once relieved of her fear, she cast a brief but significant glance at the chest. At that moment, Ali came in. Madame de Villefort made a gesture of joy and drew her son even closer to her. Edouard, she said, look at this good servant. He is most brave because he risked his own life to stop the horses that were bolting with us and the carriage which was about to crash. So thank him, because it is probable that without him we should both be dead at this moment. The child pouted and scornfully turned away. He's too ugly, he said. The Count smiled as if the child had just done precisely what he hoped. As for Madame de Villefort, she rebuked her son with a moderation that would surely not have pleased Jean-Jacques Rousseau if little Edouard had been called Emile. You see now, the Count said in Arabic to Ali, this lady asked her son to thank you for saving both their lives, and the child answered that you were too ugly. For a moment Ali's intelligent head had turned away, and he looked blankly at the boy. 
but a slight trembling of his nostril told Monte Cristo that the Arab had suffered a mortal wound. "'Tell me, monsieur,' said Madame de Villefort, getting up to leave, "'is this house your usual home?' "'No, madame,' the Count replied. "'This is a sort of pied-à-terre that I have bought. "'I live at number 30, Avenue des Champs-Élysées, "'but I see that you have entirely recovered and would like to leave.' I have just ordered these same horses to be harnessed to my carriage. This ugly boy, Ali, he said, smiling at the child, will have the honour of driving you back home, while your coachman will stay here to arrange for the repairs to your barouche. As soon as the necessary work has been done, one of my own teams will take it back to Madame Danglars. But I shall never dare to set off with those same horses, said Madame de Villefort. Oh, wait and see! Madame, Monte Cristo said, in Ali's hands they will be as mild as a pair of lambs. Ali had indeed gone over to the horses, which had with great difficulty been helped back to their feet. In his hand he carried a little sponge dipped in aromatic vinegar, and with this he rubbed the nostrils and temples of the horses, which were covered in sweat and foam. Almost at once they began to snort loudly, and for a few seconds trembled in all their limbs. Then, in the midst of a large crowd, attracted to the street outside the house by the remains of the carriage and the rumour of what had happened, Ali had the horses harnessed to the Count's coupé, took up the reins, got onto the box, and to the great astonishment of those present who had seen these same horses rushing forward as though driven by a tornado, was obliged to make good use of the whip before they would set off. Even then, the best he could obtain from these famous dappled greys now stunned and petrified, was such a listless and uncertain trot that it took Madame de Villefort nearly two hours to return to her home in the Faubourg Saint-Honoré. Hardly should had she arrived and reassured her family than she sat down to write the following letter to Madame Danglars. Dear Amine, I have just been miraculously saved, together with my son, by that same Count of Monte Cristo about whom we spoke so much yesterday evening, but whom I never thought I should see today. Yesterday you spoke to me of him with such enthusiasm that it took all the strength of my feeble spirit to refrain from mockery, but today I find your enthusiasm falls well below the man who inspired it. On reaching the Ranelar, your horses bolted, as if touched by madness, and we should probably have been dashed to pieces, poor Edward and I, against the first tree on the road, or the first village signpost. When an Arab, in short, a black man, one of the Count's servants, I believe, at, sign, at a sign from the Count, stopped the horses in their tracks, though at the risk of being run down himself. Indeed, it is a miracle that he was not. The Count ran out and had us carried into his house, Edouard and me, where he brought my son back to life. I returned home in his carriage. Yours will be sent back to you tomorrow. You will find your horses much enfeebled after the accident. It is as though they were stunned. One would not think they could not for one would think they could not forgive themselves for having been tamed by a man. The Count asks me to tell you that two days' rest on straw and no food except barley will restore them to as healthy, that is to say, as terrifying a state as before. Farewell. I do not thank you for my ride, yet on reflection it is ungrateful of me to blame you for the capriciousness of your horses, because I owe them the opportunity of meeting the Count of Monte Cristo, and, apart from his millions, this illustrious foreigner seems to me so odd and so interesting an enigma that I intend to study him at any price, even if it means another ride in the bois with your horses. Edouard bore the, deal with ex bore the ordeal with extraordinary courage. He fainted, but before that did not make a sound, and afterwards not a tear. tear. You will tell me again that I am blinded by maternal love, but there is an iron will in that frail and delicate little body. Dear Valentine sends her best wishes to your dear Eugénie. I embrace you with all my heart. Héloïse de Villefort. P.S. Arrange it so that I can meet the Count of Monte Cristo at your house. I am determined to see him again. In any case, I have just got Monsieur de Villefort to agree to pay a visit to him. I do hope it will be returned. 
That evening, the accident at Atuel was the subject of every conversation. Albert spoke of it to his mother, Chateau Renard at the jockey club, and Debray in the minister's drawing room. Even Beauchamp paid the Count the tribute in his paper of a twenty-line news item which presented the noble foreigner as a hero to all the women of the aristocracy. Several people went to leave their cards at Madame de Viforce so that they would be able to pay a second visit at the appropriate time and hear the details of this exotic event from her own lips. As for Monsieur de Viforce, as Heloise said, he took a black frock coat, white gloves and his finest livery, then got into his coach which, that same evening, drew up in front of the door of number 30, Avenue des Champs-Élysées. And I think there I shall stop.